Well, it is my honor tonight to host Dr. James White to come and teach us on the Inerrant Bible. And uh, a few things that I want to say about his ministry, some of you are very familiar with him, others are not, um, but he has been a blessing to me as a pastor. Um, I was trying to think back how long ago it was, I think about 15 or 16 years ago, uh, when I was a freshman at Southwestern Seminary, my first year in my MDiv degree, um, I found the dividing line and began listening to Dr. White on a weekly basis. And he was a great encouragement to me. And, um, you know, the more you study the Bible, the more you realize you have to learn. And when you sit down with one of those men who is capable of reading the Bible without using a translation, and I've known a number of men, uh, as seminary professors and others who can do that, it's a humbling thing for a pastor who aspires to know the Word of God and then learn from men who um, have just far exceeded others that you've ever met in studying Scripture. And we begin to realize that the Bible is God's book. He wrote it. And it is such an incredible book. And I truly believe that if you could take away anything from this mini-conference, it's that the Bible is God's Word, and it is worthy of your earnest study, and to take its message of the gospel and proclaim it to your community and to the nations. If you don't understand the authority of Scripture, um, then the rest of your theology will almost certainly go wrong. So I really want to encourage you as you learn about the Bible itself. I know Dr. White teaches on a lot of topics, but I truly believe that this is one of the most foundational and critical issues on the authority and the reliability of the scriptures. Um, I do want to say that at the end of the service, I'm going to have ushers standing at the door with offering plates tonight and tomorrow night. And 100% of what we take up is going to be given to Alpha and Omega Ministries. Uh, you may know that Dr. White just left G3 in Atlanta and came here, and he travels the nation uh, in a pickup truck and a fifth wheel, uh, teaching in local churches and at conferences. Uh, and he obviously cannot do that without the support of local churches and God's people. So I want to encourage you to give generously as you leave tonight or tomorrow night to Alpha and Omega Ministries that he can continue to teach God's word and defend the truth of the Christian faith uh, in this world. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. White. Y'all welcome him this evening. Well, it is good to be with you this evening here. Uh, I, the humidity is a little tough for an Arizona boy. Uh, uh, we don't have this kind of, uh, of moisture. Uh, and I guess you had actually had it pretty dry there for a while. Not much rain, but we got some of that today. And uh, it, is, uh, it is interesting driving across the nation. In fact, some of you mentioned that you saw the debate that I did less than two weeks ago. I was in... Uh, Mannheim, Pennsylvania, and did a debate with Dr. Gregory Coles on gay Christianity, if you're familiar with that, side B um, claims of gay Christianity, uh, things like that, then drove straight to G3. That was a busy time, and now we're here. So hopefully I can remember what in the world I'm supposed to be talking about. We're talking about Swedenborgianism, right? Is that, is that the subject thing? No? Okay. Uh, hopefully all the technical stuff will work as well. And uh, so the, the plan is uh, we, have, we have two topics, uh, tonight tomorrow night, and I seriously, seriously considered reversing um, our, our topics. Um, we, we thought maybe uh, dealing with the translation issue uh, tonight would be better because there will be people with church services tomorrow night and all. But when I thought it through, I, I just felt like I'd be wasting too much time uh, to, uh, to be able to do that, uh, to be able to uh, uh, re-explain uh, as many things. I, I have to go, go think over things more than once in that way. So we're going to do New Testament reliability. There's, there's Old Testament reliability too, but it's a completely different topic. And it is an extremely uh, difficult, uh, complex topic. Uh, and they're just there isn't, the vast majority of the conflict and, and controversy is in New Testament, 
not in the Old Testament text. And so we're doing New Testament primarily uh, this evening. So we're going to be looking at where the Bible came from, how it was transmitted to us over time, uh, remembering that the vast majority of important things in the development of the text in the New Testament uh, took place long before the English language even existed. And uh, we, we tend to forget that. We tend to make everything fit into, uh, into something else. Um, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Uh, oh, I think I know why now. If it comes back up, then I'll know why it is. It's doing it automatically. Anyway. Uh, so we will be talking about the translation issue uh, uh, tomorrow evening, and I believe, are we recording all of these things? So I think they'll be posted uh, eventually, so if you're not able to be here uh, t tomorrow evening, you'll be able to catch that material when it is, uh, when it is posted online. Uh, I did, by the way, uh, bring uh, afterwards, for those of you who are Bible aficionados, um, I have a pile of Jeffrey Rice post Tenebris Lux Bible rebinds up here, uh, including the one that launched Jeffrey Rice in his work, my Nessial in 28th edition, uh, Greek New Testament. And uh, this is the text that I preached from at G3. It is a Hebrew Bible, Old and New Testament, uh, that he bound for me, and it is, uh, it is beautiful. And uh, then the one that I'm going to have to put a guard on, uh, the Johnny Cash. Um, <laughs> This is his Johnny, this is, his, he, you'll notice it has black page edges, black ribbons, uh, all the ink on the front, even the imprinting is in black. It is the Bible in black, and uh, it's, uh, oh, smells so wonderful. It really, really does. So if you, if you want to sniff, uh, it, it's, you know, that's one thing we can sniff that's okay. I, I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's acceptable. So. All right, uh, let me take a, a poll here uh, this evening. Uh, who's got a, uh, who's got, well, this is since the, the Johnny Cash there is a legacy standard Bible giant print, uh, which is really nice for me these days. Um, and the legacy standard Bible is just simply the NASB tweaked, uh, the NASB perfected in essence. So who are NASB LSB people in the audience this evening? Okay, how about ESV people? Oh, man, did they market that so well. It's amazing. Uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible? There is the, there's the weird boys. Okay. Um, how about New King James? All right, and how about the good old King James 1611? Okay, all right. So put yourself in this situation, because this happens a lot. I have personally witnessed... Uh, to more than 5,000 LDS missionaries over the years. And uh, put yourself in this, in this situation. You're, um, uh, I used to teach many, many years ago for Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, and I was teaching an apologetics class, and one of my students asked me to come and, and speak at a very large uh, church in the valley that he was a part of to speak to his college-level folks. And this was before YouTube, so I could get away with doing this. So I pretended to be Elder Lucas from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I had a little name badge, and, and Lucas is white in Greek, so uh, it wasn't a complete lie, but, um, but it was a lot of fun to do role-playing back then. And so I came in, and, and they presented me as an elder from the local LDS church, and, and, he, and my student and I started dialoguing. And so pretty quickly, I went to the idea that the Bible's been changed, and so we need a Latter-day prophet and things like that. And he pushed back on that, and I said, well, let, let, me, let me just ask, um, how many of you out there uh, have the NIV? And that was really very popular at that time. And so a number of them said they did, and so I said, okay, and I'll, I'll do this. Uh, who, who would be my ESV volunteer? Who's, who's got an ES, a paper ESV? tonight. Oh, look at this. A bunch of cowards. Okay. I've got, all right. One, one, one man with the bravery of his convictions. Um, could, you, uh, could you read for me uh, from the ESV? You all look it up in your Bible too. It's easier to paper because the, 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 the phone doesn't work as well for this. John chapter, Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 4. Gospel of John chapter 5 verse 4. You can read it for us in the ESV so we can all hear it nice and loud. 
Ah, see, smart man, smart man, very good, see, I see him looking at the bottom of the page because the, the look of confusion came over his face because the ESV goes from John 5, 3 to John 5, 5. There is no John 5, 4 in the ESV or the NIV for that matter. Uh, it is at the bottom of the page in the teeny, teeny, tiny little font down at the bottom. It just looks to me like smudges anymore, um, but it is, it is found down there. If you have a New King James or a King James, uh, you have the story of the angel coming down troubling the waters, and the first person in would be healed. And that's not found in the NIV or the ESV. And so I remember that evening, I asked some of the students to read me John 5.4. And when they couldn't find John 5, 4, I obviously used that to my advantage as the faux Mormon missionary. Uh, we don't want to be caught by things like this. Uh, we want to know our Bibles well enough to know what the history is. And, and to be honest with you, uh, most of our good printed Bibles have full textual notes in them. The King James originally did when it was first published. Almost all King James uh, Bibles today don't. Uh, but there are originally notes in the columns and alternate readings and even textual variants were noted in the original King James because the King James scholars were, were great scholars. Um, but we have all that, all that information there, but the vast majority of us, if we are honest, don't like those notes. You may have, for example, uh, uh, will... I'm not sure if it'll come up tonight. I think that's toward the end, but I'm not sure if I'll have enough time. Um, the story of the woman taken in adultery in John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Um, it even made it into Mel Gibson's uh, movie uh, about Jesus, even though it didn't have anything to do with the plot. Because everybody loves the story. Uh, and yet, as Dallas, uh, as uh, Dallas Seminary professor Dan Wallace has said, it's his favorite story that's not actually in the Bible because it doesn't appear in any manuscript of the New Testament until the 5th century. And when it does appear, it appears uh, not only multiple places in the Gospel of John, but it actually also appears in some manuscripts in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and so we need to be aware of these historical realities, because otherwise what happens is we send our kids off to uh, LSU or to local uh, community colleges or wherever else it might be, and they are going to run into a whole bunch of people uh, who have studied under Bart Ehrman and people like that that will absolutely tear them apart because they don't know the history of their Bible. And the fact of the matter is we don't talk about it in church because you don't want to offend Mrs. Higginbotham in the back. She doesn't like when you talk about things like that. And, and her weekly check is really important. And so we don't talk about things like that. And, and the result is um, that we frequently get silenced by arguments that really aren't good arguments at all. Now, if you want to know uh, what the issues are regarding John 5, 4, let's, okay, there's, there's everything you need to know right there. Does that, does that clarify everything? Um, obviously, uh, this is, this is uh, the textual data regarding uh, John chapter 5, verse 4. Uh, and in fact, you can actually see, and I, I, my eyes aren't good enough to see these things anymore. Oh, sorry, Mr. Camera, ma'am, 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 camera, ma'am, whatever. Um, uh, you actually uh, can see uh, the various, come on now, work. Where am I? Oh, that, oh, that lazy, you can barely see it. There it is. Uh, the, the large amount of textual information. Here are P66, P75, uh, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus. We're given all this information. There's Christian scholarship doesn't hide stuff. It, it's not like dealing with the Quran and the Muslims. Muslims don't realize there are textual variants in the Quran too, but Muslims don't know it because they don't have uh, critical editions like this. Uh, they don't have that kind of information that's that easily available to them. Uh, we don't hide any of these things, and the information is there if we want to find it, if we're willing to look. Uh, but we have to know what we're looking for and why we are, why we are looking for it. So, I'm not sure why it keeps going back to that. All right, here we go. The current onslaught. So, naturalistic materialism rules the day in academia. If you can't put it on a scale, if you can't put it under a microscope, it doesn't really exist. It's just not there. Uh, so, anything that does not presuppose an uncreated universe, or just a natural, accidental universe, uh, that can be explained solely on the basis of naturalism, it's rejected a priori. We don't even give it a second thought. 
Christian claims are relegated to the arena of myth. They're just mythology. They don't really, they don't really matter in any way, shape, or form. But normally, at this point, I play a video from Bart Ehrman. I'm going to skip that this evening. Uh, you're not very far from where Bart Ehrman teaches, um, and uh, he is the uh, leading uh, English-speaking critic of New Testament Christianity in the United States today, I would say. Uh, if you're interested in seeing a debate with him where the Christian can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, I debated him in 2009. It took him about four or five years to post the debate, even though we gave him the debate right afterwards. Um, and when he did post it, he gave me probably the greatest compliment that he's ever given anyone he's debated. And when he posted it, he said, this was probably not my best debate. That's about the best you're going to get out of, uh, out of Dr. Ehrman. Would love to debate him again, but that, that $25,000 speaking fee is just a little bit steep uh, for my little, my little ministry. Now, wait a minute. Go back. Are, are you ready for audio? Ready? Okay, good. Uh, now I have to go through these again because I went all the way back. What I want to play for you is a period of the cross-examination that took place in 2006 in a debate that I did at Biola University uh, between myself and Shabir Ali. He's now Dr. Shabir Ali. It wasn't at that time. He is one of the preeminent Islamic apologists uh, in, uh, in the United States. Well, in the world. He's actually from Canada. And I want you to listen as Shabir speaks. Uh, most, more, most Muslims, and Mormons too for that matter, but most Muslims don't know nearly as much about the Bible as Shabir. But I want you to hear, especially what he says toward the end of this. It's a couple minutes, uh, but listen in and see if you're not um, uh, find, if you don't find it interesting. Is there any way that you can give to us this evening to explain to us uh, how we can determine what is still inspired in the New Testament and what is not? Well, I believe that uh, Muslims have a simple answer to this in saying that whatever is in the Quran, uh, that would be a, a judge of whatever is there in, in the Bible. So whatever of the Bible agrees with the Quran, that obviously is inspired. What uh, is contradictory is obviously not from God. And that which is neutral and either agree in agreement nor in disagreement um, may be treated with some bit of silence. Usually the classical scholars have recommended silence. But I believe that uh, Muslims who are quite familiar with the Gospels and uh, familiar with the development uh, of the text over time can make some judgments, uh, though these judgments will be tentative. So everything about the cross, resurrection, atonement, deity of Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy Spirit is a divine person, not an angel, Gabriel. All of that stuff is, is uninspired and, and a corruption of the original intention of the New Testament in light of the Quran. A Muslim would say that uh, the Quranic revelation is here now as a pristine word of God that teaches us that there is only one God, that Jesus is his uh, me Messiah, but nevertheless a servant, a messenger of the one true God. And so anything that is contrary to that, something that teaches, for example, uh, that human responsibility as described in the Quran is to be somehow evaded, um, that, that would be contrary and would be thought to be a later development. Now, of course, that could be studied from another angle. One can look at the history and development of Christian teaching over time. One can look at the Gospels, uh, even without Islamic presuppositions. And it seems to me that uh, many uh, biblical scholars are coming to conclusions which are very close to the main conclusions which uh, Muslims insist on, that Jesus was uh, an apocalyptic uh, prophet, like the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, he preached uh, the belief in God, similar to the belief in the, uh, that was known uh, from the Jewish prophet, since he himself was Jewish, he lived in a Jewish milieu. You mean and people so like the Jesus Seminar, uh, John Dominic Cross and Marcus Borg. Uh, it doesn't have to be them. The scholars are so numerous, it'll be hard for us to list them and, and to, to name them now. So but is, there, is, there any, uh, is there any New Testament book uh, that Mark, for example, which you've referred to many times, Mark clearly identifies Jesus as the Son of God, puts words in his mouth that you would never be able to accept as a Muslim. Isn't that correct? Well, it is clear that even Mark uh, must have um, uh, suffered from a similar sort of phenomenon that we uh, described in the case of Matthew. 
And John Bowden has made specifically that point in his book, Jesus, the Unanswered Questions. If we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, which in many Bibles begin the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is noted in the NIV, for example, that the title, the Son of God, in this particular verse uh, is not found in some of the most ancient and reliable manuscripts. So I'm not saying that the gospel according to Mark does not present Jesus as the Son of God, but we have to be aware of scribal changes that have affected the gospel according to Mark in places as well. And uh, in fact, we are working with the gospel according to Mark only as it has come down to us. Knowing the history of scribal changes, uh, we would not be out of our grounds to wonder if in fact we do really have the original Mark and Gospel. Would you admit that you do not have any uh, hard manuscript evidence from the first or second centuries that gives to us a New Testament that looks like a Muslim would expect it to look like? We do not have such a document. So there's exchange with a Muslim scholar, and of course the Muslims believe that the Bible has been uh, corrupted and changed. They're not exactly sure when, uh, but they do believe that, and we've, we've had a number of debates on that. In fact, you might find the debate I did, one of the debates I did in London with Adnan Rashid to be very uh, interesting along, along those particular lines if you wanted to pursue that more. Uh, but the point is, the Muslims know how to, for example, read the footnotes. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, there is a textual variant there. Some manuscripts say, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Some other manuscripts do not have the phrase, the Son of God. Now, there's a reason for that. It's not that this is something that's new. We've known this probably since, oh, I don't know when the first discussion of that particular textual variant is, but it probably is in the third or fourth century. So it's been a long, 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 long time. Uh, but if we aren't looking at those notes and we're not familiar with that kind of background information, that can be a troubling thing, if, especially if you've never even thought about it, never had any discussion of it uh, going on. So let's think about a, a few other things. Uh, we know that scholars spin the evidence, particularly in media appearances. They emphasize that all we have are copies of copies of copies from hundreds of years after the originals. That's Bart Ehrman. That's his, his thing. But let's get, to, let's get down to the, the nitty gritty. Uh, we have 5,800 plus manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek. That does not mean that every manuscript contains all of the New Testament. The farther back you go, the more fragmentary they are. We'll be looking at some later on uh, in the evening. Um, but we have 5,800 handwritten manuscripts. Remember, photo, photo, photocopier wasn't invented until 1949. So till then, uh, you had to either hand write or hand typeset, uh, if once printing was invented, uh, anything that you wanted to make multiple copies of. So a variant is any difference in word order, whether a verse is there or isn't there, um, how something's spelled. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different ways of identifying what a variant is. But how many variants do you think might be in the New Testament? Now, what happens when I ask this question now? is that since I've been giving this presentation for decades, there are people sitting down front that have heard this before, and they know the exact number, and they scream it out, and they are very proud of themselves. Don't. I want you, I only want answers from people who have not seen the presentation before. About how many variants do you think uh, we might have in the New Testament, in all of those manuscripts? Anyone? We've got... I, I've got 1,000. Can I go two, two, 2,000, 2,000, three, 3,000? Three, no, no, okay. We've got 50. We've got 1,000. Uh, I'm sort of feeling a little bit like the, uh, the Price is Right guy who, uh, by the way, died at 99. So we, he got to 99, didn't go over 100. It was, it was exactly how, how it was supposed to work. We spun the wheel and did it well. Good old Bob Barker. Um, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> and then the others are going, oh, poor Bob. We all spayed and neutered our pets because of Bob Barker, but our pets don't like Bob Barker, but uh, other than that, um, I've got 50 and I've got 1,000. Anybody want to go above or below? One. Oh, we got one. You know, this would be a really short presentation if there was only one variant, trust me, trust me. Okay, we got, we got one, we got 50, we got 500, and we got 1,000. All right, okay, all right, here we go. How many do we think we've got? How about about 400,000? Maybe up to 500,000. Yep. Now, so you get that number, and that's what, that's what people, I heard, I heard some lady go, did you say good gravy? Was that what you said? 
I, that's, 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 what my mom, that's, that's something my mom would have said. Good gravy. <laughs> I love it. So there are 138,213 words in the New Testament in the uh, Greek New Testament. And so what you're told, that's, that's, that's nearly three variants per word. And so you go, to, you go to local community colleges and stuff like that, and my, my, my daughter ran into this. I'm not, sure if any, I'm not sure if anybody here listens to Sheologians. Any Sheologian fans? All right, way to go, Summer. Yay. Um, my daughter, uh, someone tried to insult my daughter recently uh, by saying that she's James White's daughter and the apple didn't f fall very far from the tree. And she and I are like, yeah, you know. We're, that's, that wasn't an insult. We were very happy about that. Um, uh, she, she ran into a nasty, nasty, nasty professor uh, her first year in college. I mean, this was a foul-mouthed, anti-Christian, just, oh. Uh, um, and she put up with it for a while, but then when he was going on and on and on about the language of the New Testament, she knew better. She's been attending my de debates since she was eight. Um, she knew better, and so she challenged him, and he went all crazy and his final challenge to her was to Google it. Isn't that deep? That's great. No, Google it. Yeah. Right, thanks. Um, that's the kind of stuff you're going to hear from them. There are only 138,213 words. There's 400,000 variants. So nobody has any idea uh, what, what the New Testament actually said, uh, what was actually written. And so you can't, you can't make an argument from the text. You Christians, you're just, you're just out to lunch. Now, that's all baloney. But we have to be able to explain why it's baloney. Just saying it's baloney doesn't accomplish anything. Just, just saying, well, we shouldn't even be talking about that. No, look, the truth is on our side. It's not on their side. And we need to know what it is. But that means we have to admit when there are, for example, that many variants in the New Testament. You don't deny it. You just have to understand what the variants were, what the nature of them is, and why it is that that is actually a reflection of the way God preserved his word, not a reason to reject it, okay? So, this is what you'd be told. Uh, here's the number of words in the New Testament right here, and here's the number of variants. That does not look very good at all, but what we need to do is move on from there, what they don't tell you. And part of it, part of it's because, especially someone like that professor, just is ignorant, he doesn't know. Uh, he shouldn't be commenting on it because he's ignorant, but. But still, others do know. Bart Ehrman knows. That's for sure. 99% of all variants do not impact the meaning of the text. Variations in spelling and word order make up the vast bulk of the variations. For most of them, uh, you would have to know Greek to be able to even understand what the, what the, what the uh, variant would be. It doesn't impact how it's translated into English at all. So it doesn't impact the meaning of the text. At least 99% of them. Uh, fall into that. There's one that's a, one of the most common variants is called the movable new. The movable new. Uh, any Greek students in the, uh, in the audience? Anyone's taken Koine Greek? Okay, just a couple of you have taken Koine Greek. Okay. Uh, I, had a, uh, I had a fellow student my first year in Greek. Uh, Med Skeens was his name. And he, I've, I keep running into Med once in a while. Med just could not figure out the movable new. Now, we have a movable new in English. You're supposed, now I'm down south here, so this is not really the best illustration, but you're supposed to say an apple, not a apple, right? You're supposed to put an N in there. Some people just struggle with that. And in some places, you just don't do it at all because it doesn't sound right. But they had the same thing in Greek. And scribes struggled with that, and a bunch of the variants are whether the movable news there or not. It does not impact meaning at all. It has, again, no, no relevance whatsoever. So, hence, 1% of 400,000 equals about 4,000 meaningful textual variants. Out of 138,213 words is 2.9%, or one meaningful variant every three pages. But only half of these are viable. What does viable mean? Well, uh, if you find a variant in a 13th century manuscript. And it's not found in any manuscript for the first over 1,000 years of Christian history. None of the ancient uh, translations of the New Testament into other languages, which are very, very important. 
The Latin translations, Boharic, Coptic, Sahidic, these are all important because they, are, they testify as to what, you know, what Greek, what did the Greek manuscripts that they were translating from contain? Okay, so they are important witnesses. Uh, but if you find a, a, a manuscript from like the 13th century that has a reading in it that has no support before that, no support from any of the early church fathers, no support from any of the early versions, that's not a viable reading. It has no, there's no way, there's no reason to believe that that's the original reading because it has left no trace through history whatsoever. By the way, uh, tomorrow night, one of the more interesting variants that we'll look at uh, in regards to King James is exactly a variant that appears first in the 13th century, and it's in your King James Bible. But nobody before that had ever seen it. So you, you literally have to believe that Christians for 1,300 years didn't have the right version of this verse uh, and, and go from there. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow night. So only about half of those are viable. So there are about 1,500 to 2,000 viable, meaningful New Testament textual variants. So what that means is they could be the original and they do impact the meaning of the text. So 15, about 1,500 to, to 2,000. Now think about that for just a second. That is a very, very different picture than what we looked at before. In fact, this is what it would look like. Here's now the number of words, and there's the number of the meaningful variants. Very different than what you saw before, isn't it? But again, how often do you hear any uh, discussion of this, even in Sunday school classes and things like that? Um, sadly, uh, in, 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 not in all seminaries, but in a lot of seminaries today, I know in, the, in some of the seminaries I've taught for, um, Discussion of this kind of stuff has been replaced by church leadership stuff and, and all sorts of stuff that um, isn't overly biblical but is now required of pastors and things like that. So, so, but think with me for a moment. If you only have one manuscript of an ancient work, how many textual variants will you have? Zero. You can't have a textual variant because you only got one copy. So there's no differences because you don't have anything else to compare it to. So the more copies you have of a work, the more textual variants you're going to have. But what would you rather have? Would you rather have 100 copies of your ancient work or only one? Because if you only have one, you have to trust that that one scribe got it right the first time. You got no way to check them. And see, a lot of people want that. Uh, remember uh, Indiana Jones and the, what was it, the Holy was, what was it the Holy Grail? Was that the main name of the movie? Yeah, Last Crusade. Okay, okay. But he was looking for the looking for the Grail thing, and they they find the old guy in the cave, you know, who's like I don't know it's how many hundreds of years old. Um, and uh, that's that's what people sort of want the New Testament to be. Why couldn't God have just given us the the perfect copy? and then entrusted it to that guy <laughs> uh, you know, who lives forever. And then if we want to really know, we, we go to the mouth of the cave and we ask, and, and he tells us, and then, and then it, that, that's how it all works, right? Here's, here's the problem with that. How do you know what he's been doing in there for the last 700 years? How do you know he hasn't been messing with it? That's what we want. We don't want those notes down at the bottom of the page. We want to have you know, sort of something like that. But look. How did Christianity spread across the Roman world? It was by getting the word of God out and by letting people copy it, and it spread all over the place, and that's how the gospel has been spread. So there's, there's a result. The more copies you have, the more textual variants you're going to have. But it's much better to have lots of copies of something from lots of different people at lots of different times than it is to have one copy. The one, the one concept, that's what the Muslims have. The Muslims have a controlled, a closed transmission because there was an editing of the Quran. And then other versions were, were burned uh, and destroyed. Well, now you've got to trust that what they did when they did the editing was the exact right thing. You can't go beyond that. The New Testament was not transmitted that way, and that is a far, far better thing uh, than any other way of doing it. There are 5,800 plus catalog manuscripts in New Testament books, average of which is 350 pages long. Uh, that's a fair amount of uh, writing. That is over 2 million pages of text grand total. And so when you think about that, 2 million, 
1,500 to 2,000 meaningful and viable variants over 2 million pages of hand-copied text spanning approximately 1,500 years prior to the invention of printing is an amazingly small percentage of the text reflecting an amazingly accurate history of transmission. One might say it is downright miraculous. But see, that's not what you hear. That's why you've got to know it. Grandparents, you've got to know it to make sure to be able to explain it to your grandkids and to your great-grandkids. And homeschool teachers, you've got to be able to communicate this to your kids because they're not going to get it almost anyplace else. We all need to know this. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Of all the stuff we argue about and all the stuff we read about and we, we have all these fights and stuff on social media and everything else, if just the, the believing Christian people in evangelical churches would spend the amount of time to understand this stuff and communicate it to the next generations, we would close the door on so much apostasy, it would not even be, it wouldn't even be funny. Because people don't know that the New Testament is by far the most widely attested, earliest attested, and best attested work of all of antiquity. We don't know that. We can't prove it. We may have heard it, but we need to be able to intelligently express it to other people. That's just, it's just necessary. So very, very important. All right, let me give you some examples. It's, you can see it. Um, years ago, I asked my computer to compare the two most dissimilar printed Greek texts that I had. Uh, for those of you who are into this stuff, in other words, comparing a Byzantine and an Alexandrian text. Here in Ephesians 1, you see the green right there, and there's green right there, 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 and there. Those are all the major differences in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, one of those variants is actually uh, relevant. Right down here, when it says ha, ha estin arabon, um, that's in reference to the Holy Spirit. And the other reading is has. And if you know Greek, then you know that's the difference between a masculine and a neuter. And the neuter matches pneuma in, in its gender. Has would, would more strongly emphasize the personality of the spirit. So it's, it's not that it's unimportant. It should be looked at. It's there. But you'll notice the vast majority of the text, there's no meaningful variation at all. It it's all says, that says the same thing. Um, whoop, whoa. Now stop that now. Okay. Now, the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is unique. I think we can all agree on that uh, on many, many levels. Uh, but the book of Revelation, we have the fewest manuscripts of any of the other New Testament books. You know why? Because it struggled for acceptance in the canon. There were a lot of people in the early church that went, nah, I don't think so. And to be honest with you, it's probably good that it had to struggle. I, I, I don't think it would be good for the early church to be going, you know, I don't think we have enough books with ten-headed monsters and seven-headed beasts, and we need some more books. Like, can we come up with any more? Because there were a lot of people writing books like that back then. Uh, there was a lot of questions. Did John really write that? Was there a real message here? It had to struggle. And as a result, we have the fewest manuscripts of uh, all the New Testament books is from Revelation, and it's got some textual issues. There's no two ways about it. Uh, you can see there's much more green in this one, but still the vast majority of the text is the same. It's not, not been changed. Mark, you've got a little bit there in Mark 1, 1 through 14. In fact, there's the variant at the end of Mark 1, 1, the Son of God. There's the variant right there. Um, and what's interesting is the current theory is that Mark's the earliest uh, written of the, of the Gospels. Uh, I'm not so certain about that myself. Uh, but what's interesting is, of the four Gospels, we have the fewest early manuscripts of Mark. Uh, which of the Gospels do we have the er most early manuscripts? John. John. Which scholarship says is the last one written, but uh, you never know. And guess which book of the New Testament has the fewest textual variants in it? Hebrews. Whoa, hey, come on now. I mean, I only see that one there and that one there. Oh, and there's one right there. None of them are at all uh, relevant to the meaning of the text at all. So Hebrews is the one that gives us the uh, least variance to look at, which is really interesting. Now, not sure what's going on with that, but we will press on. Even the 1,500 to 2,000 number needs to be understood. Even when the variant does impact the reading, in the large majority of instances, the careful student in the text can see which reading is original. 
Many of these errors involve common scribal errors, mistakes we continue to make to this very day when copying from one text to another. Here's an example from the history of the New Testament itself. Now, unfortunately, these illustrations are not quite as helpful with young people as they were with my generation because young people don't copy out of books anymore. It's all electronic. I mean, young people have never had the joy of taking a book and trying to figure out how to prop it open while you are typing, not on a computer, but on an IBM selector. Now that was a typewriter, wasn't it? Wasn't it? How many of you, how many of you are fellow Selectric vet, veterans, IBMs? Oh, see, they only have, most of you can't get your arms up about the, but beyond that just because of arthritis, you know. Um, and you young folks, one of the reasons you all, all are supposed to respect us old people, you got to understand, when I wrote all my papers in high school, um, you'd be typing a, a page, and when you made a mistake, you didn't hit backspace. You got out the correction tape, and you had to go back, and you had to hit it, and either that, or you had white out. Little black thing. Of, you know, I am pretty certain that if you sniffed white out, that probably would, you know, uh, cause insanity eventually. And you had to, you know, go over it, and then you have to go back over and type it. That's what we had to do. And then you know the worst thing that would ever happen? You get through the whole page and you, you've, you've got it perfect, and you get to the bottom of the page, and you forgot your footnote. You forgot your footnote. And you know what you did? You pulled the paper out, you crumpled it up, you threw it away, and you started all over again. That's, that, that is why you young people, when you see us old folks, you need to have respect for us. <laughs> Because we not only wrote our papers doing that, we had to do it quietly as the dinosaurs walked by outside. See, that's, that was a really tricky part. Because you, you couldn't scream when you messed up that, that page. So you had to be very, very careful. So the illustrations that I use don't necessarily work for the young folks because they're just copying and pasting electronically. And that's a, that's a brand new thing. That's not how anyone ever made a copy of anything uh, up until only a few years ago. If you look at 1 John 3, 1 in your Bible, and check it out, uh, because the King James and the New King James, which are based upon what's called the Textus Receptus, will have one reading, and the NASB, ESV, NIV, blah, 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 blah uh, based upon the Nestial in Greek text, which is the one right there in green, will have a different reading. So, 1 John 3, 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. All right? And the New American Standard says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Now, for the men in the audience who are colorblind, and there always are, uh, and such we are is in red. It's in the New American Standard, ESV, so on and so forth. It is not in the King James or the New King James um, Version. Now, why? Now, at this point... If we were to do what a lot of King James only uh, folks do, such as Stephen Anderson, uh, if any of you have ever seen the interview that I did with him uh, a number of years ago, uh, where they did basically an entire movie about one textual variant in 1 Timothy 3.16, uh, what you'd do here is you'd go, well, you know, those Anglican translators, the King James, they don't really believe in the adoption of the sons of God. I mean, look at the Anglican church today. It's Church of England. It's apostate. Oh my goodness, we just, you know, and you just go on and on and on and on. But that has absolutely nothing to do with why the King James reads the way it reads, and any other modern translation reads the way it reads. It has nothing to do with it at all. Why is there a difference? Well, hopefully this will be helpful for you. What we have here, I'm not going to read all the way through this, is what's called homoiteluton. Homoiteluton means similar ending. And this is what I was saying earlier. When you're copying... Um, from a book, for example, you're copying from someone else's manuscript or something like that. In English, there are certain uh, word endings that are very common. T-I-O-N, E-S. These many words end with E-S or T-I-O-N or uh, I-N-G and things like that because it's just a, a common grammatical conclusion to 
uh, gerunds, and so on and so forth. And so what happens is you are, you're copying something, and you, you look at it, and most people do will do like two or three words at a time. And so you read a phrase, and you write down, and let's say the last word in your phrase is education. And so you're writing or you're typing, and you put education. Your eye goes back to what you're copying. You find T-I-O-N, and you continue on. The problem is that T-I-O-N was at the end of a word farther down the line. And so you have inadvertently deleted everything that was between that word and education. Or it might be on the line below it. And now you've deleted everything in between. And at first, you might go, yeah, but it, it, then it wouldn't make any sense. Okay, that could happen, but a lot of times, it will still continue to make sense. And so you won't even notice it unless you proofread it. Okay, that's called homoeteleuton. It's a common error that, ma that people make. If I were to take something handwritten and pass it out to everybody in the front row and have you hand copy it and give your copy to the next row and then the next row and the next row, it goes all the way to the back. By the time we got to the back, we would find numerous examples of homoeteleuton, where people had skipped words for similar endings, or these days, because you just couldn't make heads or tails out of what the guy in front of you wrote, because no one does handwriting anymore, and so who in the world could read it anyways, right? So, with that in mind, here is 1 John 3, 1. Uh, Behold what sort of love uh, the Father has given to us in order that technotheu, children of God, Thoman, we might be called, Kai Esmen, and we are, Dea Tuta Hakasmas Uganoskai Imas. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. So notice that next to and we are is this little square. You go down here, the textual apparatus, there's the square. These are the manuscripts that do not have and we are, including this one right here. See, that looks like a, a, an M, a capital M. That's a fracture M. That means the majority text. So the majority of manuscripts do not contain and we are, okay? So keep that in mind, the majority text does not read and we are. But that still hasn't explained how this variant arose. So I'm going to show it to you now, and you're going to be absolutely positively amazed. So ancient writers made the same errors. Here is the relevant portion of the Greek as it would have appeared in the unseal or majuscule text of the days of the New Testament. Now. What you see up there is two lines of capital letters. No punctuation, no space between words. And for the first 900 years of the history of the copying of the New Testament, that's exactly what all the manuscripts look like. They're just long lines of capital letters with no spaces between words and no punctuation. That's why the vast majority of Seminary graduates, you hand them an ancient manuscript, you hand them one of the papyri or something like that, they won't have a clue what to do with it. Because that's not what the Greek, that's not what this looks like. This, is, this has got capital forms and small forms and spaces and punctuation and everything else. It's wonderful. But for the first 900 years, all caps, no punctuation, no space between words. So here's what, I'll use color now. There. And again, for those of you who don't see red, uh, there's mu epsilon nu, mu epsilon nu. So, techna theu, theu is a nomen of sacred. I'll tell you about that late, later on. Children of God, clay thomen, we might be called, kai esmen, and we are, dia tuta, for this reason the world does not know us. So, clay thomen and esmen end with the exact same three letters. And so what happened in an early uh, copying of 1 John is a scribe writes down Claythoman, eyes go back to the original, he sees the men at the end of Esmen, continues on. It's not someone trying to edit anything. It's not someone trying to change theology. It's just the way that we copy things and see things. And if we didn't have lots of manuscripts of 1 John, including lots of early manuscripts of 1 John, then we would lose this affirmation of the fact that we are the children of God. We have truly been adopted into his family. I think that's sort of important. I think it's good to be able to know that. 
to be able to understand why it was, and to not blame the King James translators. They were just simply dealing. The King James translators, as we'll see tomorrow night, did not look at manuscripts. They used printed texts. They used the printed texts of Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza, specifically Beza's 1598. And so those were based upon a small number of manuscripts, a very small number of manuscripts in comparison to what we have today. But the manuscripts they were based upon were later manuscripts, and therefore they did not have this important affirmation of our uh, adoption as sons and daughters of God. So that's what homoi teleuton is, and that explains how variants can arise. It's just simply, look, they didn't have LASIK. <laughs> they didn't have fluorescent tubes uh, in, in lights. Uh, they didn't have reading glasses. Um, and very often, uh, they were copying by candlelight uh, and in a room with a bunch of monks who hadn't ever showered. Um, so, you know, you just think it through, and there's reasons why there could be distractions and, and so on and so forth in, uh, in, in stuff like that. All right? Now, the majority of the 5,800 plus Greek manuscripts date from after 1000 AD, comprising the majority text. There's that Fractur M again. And that makes sense. I mean, you're going to have, you know, centuries are not good. I mean, someone brought a copy of the, the King James Only Controversy, my book, up to me. And it was one of the original printings, and it's all the pages are already yellow. Most of the paper we use today is not going to last more than 200 years because it's cheap. Uh, and so it's amazing that we even have the number of manuscripts that we have from that, that long ago, given all the things that can destroy a piece of paper, fire and bugs and war and flood and heat and cold and snow and everything else. It's uh, pretty, pretty amazing. The earlier texts are called papyri texts, written in unseal, unseal or majuscule. Papyri, you take the leaves of the papyrus plant, you put them at 90 degree angles, press them together. Makes a nice smooth surface on one side, not so smooth on the other side. We'll talk about that a little bit later on uh, as well. So here's a, a little graph real quickly about our New Testament manuscripts. You can see the, uh, the blue ones are the papyri. The green ones are called the unseal. They are written um, on parchment. Say so last longer, uh, a smoother surface. And then you can see, here's, here's where the scribe somewhere in the ninth century said, hey, how about we use big letters, small letters, and put spaces between words? And everyone's like, that's a really good idea. And so you immediately see that very quickly, that becomes the uh, uh, next century, there's almost no unseals left. And after that point, it's all minuscules. Uh, and that's, uh, that's how that happened, uh, historically speaking. Uh, just in passing, I do want to mention this. A lot of people talk about, well, we should just go with the majority text, you know, count noses. If you have a variant and there you have 500 manuscripts and, and 300 read one way and 200 read the other way, that you go with the 300. Why not, right? The problem is that gives you a different text depending on, upon what century you're living in. And that's problematic. Um, here, for example, are... Uh, the Alexandrian and Byzantine, and these, these terms are beginning to be altered, but when you look at the first centuries, uh, the manuscripts are almost uniformly Alexandrian, and then the Byzantines start showing up. And what would be the majority text at this point? It would still be Alexandrian. But a thousand years later, later it's Byzantine. So that's not really a way, I think, that you can properly uh, handle this. Now, one of the things I like to do is you look down at the bottom of the page in your New Testament, it says... Uh, the best early manuscripts say this, and the best early, but they never show you what the manuscripts are. And I think it's helpful for folks to have an idea of what these things look like. And I've had the opportunity over the years, uh, not much anymore, uh, but b before travel ended for me at the end of 2019 overseas, uh, to see a number of these manuscripts myself. So I want to show some of them to you. Uh, this is probably, you know, there's arguments about this. You can find. You can find good scholars that argue on both sides of things, but this is probably the earliest fragment of the New Testament that we have. Uh, Ryland's 47, better known as P52. It's about the size of a credit card. And, of course, it's made of papyrus. It's written on both sides. We do not know why. Christians did not like writing the New Testament on scrolls. We have very few New Testament scrolls, about no more than a dozen. Uh, the Christians wanted the codex. They wanted the 
the kind of book form that we have, where you write on both sides, you fold the page, and you create a codex form of a book, which is what we use. Uh, we don't know why they did that, uh, because you, you look at historically, you go to the libraries, they're all, they all scrolls, but Christians didn't like it. And so here you have P52. It's about the size of a credit card. I don't have time to go into it right now. I love P52. My, my family will tell you, my kids especially uh, enjoyed the fact that only, only about 10 years ago, I did a whole special Christmas presentation in the front room with a digital projector doing a Christmas story based upon P52. <laughs> How do you do that? You'll have to ask my kids. Um, but uh, I have the fonts. This is one of the reasons I have to use my own computer when I do this. A lot of people say, just give us a keynote. Doesn't work. Because here's what it would look like. I have fonts that match the early papyri manuscripts. And so that's how the text would have flowed around uh, what we have here. And what's super cool about P52 is that if you had gone to school in Germany in the 1870s, they would have taught you uh, that it is the assured conclusion of critical scholarship that the Gospel of John could not have been written any earlier than about 170 AD. Why? Well, because John has such a high Christology. And we all know that developed over time because Jesus wasn't like that. And so this had to have been, couldn't have been written any earlier than 170 AD. And what I, what I think is just wonderful is in 1932, some enterprising British scholar is rummaging through ancient papyri that had been stolen from Egypt by the Brits when they controlled Egypt. And he comes across this tiny little fragment, and he's smart enough. You know, how, do you have any idea how hard it is to read something like that when all you have are fragments of words? I mean, that is tough work. And he recognized immediately what it was. You know where P52 is from? It's from John chapter 18, verses 31, to, uh, verse 31, 34 on one side, 37, 38 on the back. Now, why is that important? Because once he found this thing, they sent it to the four leading papyrologists today. And how do you date a papyrus? They don't have, they don't, it, you know, it doesn't say up the top, uh, printed uh, on such and such a date. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Uh, you, you do it by the forms of the letters and what was common in that day. And so you can't go, well, this was written on such and such a day and such and such a year. Normally what you do is you do a 50-year window. So 25 years each direction, sometimes as wide as a 50-year, 50-year either, either direction. And so uh, three of the four dated it to around 125 to 150, and one put it in the first century, so like 95, something like that. So if this is, say, around 125 to 150, uh, how could you have the Gospel of John being written in 170 when we have a copy of it from 125? So all this, this German scholarship uh, that was, the, was the, the talk of the town went up in flames uh, with the discovery of a single manuscript that demonstrated that John was much, much earlier. And I think it's really cool what is the, what's in John chapter 18. That's Jesus' discussion with Pilate about truth. What is truth? And it could be that our earliest manuscript, our earliest fragment, uh, has portions of that conversation. I think it's pretty cool. Now, I am a complete geek. So here I am uh, in 2009 debating Bart Ehrman. That's Bart Ehrman on the right. And look at my tie. It's P52. Both sides of P52, fully readable. The original manuscript was not harmed in the making of my tie. I want you to understand that. And there I am giving Bart Ehrman his own P52 tie. That's one of the few times he smiled during the debate. Um, I don't know what he does with it. Maybe he wears it once a year to mock fundamentalists or something. Maybe he burned it. I have no earthly idea. But I gave it to him anyways. And, uh, and there you go. That was an interesting, interesting evening. Now, this one's a lot of fun. And I could probably start a fist fight in here. And, uh, and uh, I know that your dear pastor and I do not have the exact same eschatology. So I'm going to be really careful here. In fact, what I love doing is I love going into churches and I just point this out. Then I run out the back door and say, ask the pastor. Um, but this is one of the two papyri manuscripts we have from the book of Revelation. Like I said, we don't have much for Revelation. And the way it's laid out here, that's what the page originally looked like, and this is what we have left. All right, so most of it's missing. Most of it's gone. 
And whenever anybody goes, man, those papyri, they're in really bad shape, I just look at them and go, what are you going to look like in 1,800 years? They've actually done pretty well, uh, if you ask me. Now, this one, and by the way, I did all the graphics that you're going to be seeing, all the movement of stuff. So if you have to go, ooh, uh, it's okay. It's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll live with it. I, I did it all myself. But what's really neat about this is what... <laughs> A little slow there. <laughs> A little slow. Come on now. Um... <laughs> really slow. <laughs> this is from Revelation chapter 13. Okay, enough with the ooh and ah, okay? We, we'll, we, hold off on that. I'll, I'll sort of let you know when you need to do that. What's in Revelation chapter 13? The number of the beast. Oh. Any of you old enough to remember back when Nixon was running for president uh, for the second term when people were saying that Henry Kissinger's name added up to 666? Anybody old enough? To Did you know Kissinger? Do you remember Kissinger? you know Kissinger is still alive? He's 143. It's amazing. It really is. He's still alive. Uh, I, th I thought he was old when I was a kid, and now he's, he's, still, he's still out there. Um, I think every presidential candidate's name has been added up to 666. We did it with Hillary. That one yeah, might be... <laughs> I'd agree with that one. Obama, everybody, they've added up to 666. I think somebody did it with Trump, too, or something like that. But here's the problem. The problem is right, I get there, there, right there. That's not 666, that's 616. The two earliest papyri manuscripts we have of Revelation say the number of the beast is 616, not 666. Now, uh, Hal Lindsey, when he discovered about this, had a heart attack. It's a bad thing that that happened, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, Jerry Jenkins was left behind by this information, and uh, <laughs> uh, I think Dan Wallace at Dallas Seminary figured it out, though, and I, will give him, I always give him full credit for this. Uh, Dan Wallace believes that 666 is the number of the beast, and 616 is the number of the neighbor of the beast. Think it through, get it, the address, you know, the, oh, never mind. Okay. I will let you figure that out. Now, I just would happen to throw out there that 666 and 616 are both how you spell Nero in Hebrew and Greek. But anyways, we'll just sort of leave that off to the side for now. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a little fun stuff from Revelation. Now, this manuscript is P72. This is the earliest copy we have of 1st, 2nd Peter and Jude. And this is very readable. Um, I saw this very page in 1993 when I was at the World Youth Day in Denver, Colorado, debating Jerry Mattatix on the papacy. And the Pope was there, and that's why we were debating the papacy. And so this was on display. And so I got to see this. I got to translate this, um, at least up until when the security people felt I needed to move on, because I was spending too much time staring at that weird piece of paper. Um, but you can see certain things here. So, for example, Petru Epistole Bay. That's the beginning of 2 Peter. There's the end of 1 Peter. You see these words that have lines over them? There's one there, 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 there. Uh, those are called nomina sacra. Nomina sacra, the sacred names. We don't know why. But all the Christian, early Christian manuscripts abbreviate God, Jesus, Lord, Spirit, and put a line over the top, either as two or three letter abbreviations. We don't know why. There's lots of theories, but we don't know why. That's how you can recognize an ancient Christian manuscript, because the Nomen is sacred. You just see those lines. Nobody else did it, so it marked Christian manuscripts off. We don't know why. And it is interesting. Uh, here is a portion of that right there. You're getting better at this. That's good. That's good. That's good. This is called a Granville Sharp construction, and that's why your Bibles uh, should read uh, at 2 Peter 1.1, 1 .1, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, one of the reasons I emphasize this is the Da Vinci Code. Remember the, the book, the Da Vinci Code, and the movie and stuff? said that 
uh, uh, Council of Nicaea, Constantine invented the deity of Christ. Up till then, nobody believed in it. This manuscript was written long before Constantine was even conceived and identifies Jesus as God. So much for the millions of dollars Dan Brown got for lying to everybody. But anyways, um, so there it is early on in this, uh, this manuscript, which is the earliest we have of, uh, of Second Peter. Next, slow fade there to a blank screen. Oh, there we go. Here is P75. Now, this one is amazing. P75 is, uh, we know, is directly related to Codex Vaticanus or Codex B. Codex Vaticanus is from either about 325 to 350, somewhere around in there. One is not a copy of the other, but they are both related to an earlier manuscript. So when P75, which contains the Gospels, but all we have left is Luke and John, when P75 and Codex Vaticanus agree on a reading, that's taking us back uh, to about 125 AD. Now, you need to understand something. I'm going to point this out later. Any other work of antiquity, the average time frame between when it was written and our first copy, 900 years. We're talking here about where P75 and Vaticanus agree takes us back to 125 for books that were written in the middle of the first century. That's less than 100 years later. Nine times closer. Those, those critics never talk about that part. They never talk about that part. Now, what's also fascinating about P75 is it's an incredibly accurate manuscript. You know why? If you're going to make a copy of something, would you, and handwritten copy, would you copy one sentence at a time, one phrase at a time, two or three words at a time, one word at a time? We know how this scribe did it. We can tell by the kinds of errors he made. I mean, everyone's going to make errors. You know how he did it? Letter by letter. Not even word by word. He did it letter by letter and produced one of the ac most accurate early manuscripts we have from as early as 175 of the Gospels. Uh, pretty important manuscript. Here's P66. This guy was a little bit more concerned about how good his book looked. I like this particular scan because it shows you what the book looked like. Most of the others show you only a page. They've all been separated out. But that's what the book would look like. And you notice how the papyri has broken down where? At the bottom corner and the top corner. That's where your Bible and your books get wear too. You put them on a shelf or something like that. That's where the, the wear is going to take place. And that's why almost all the papyri have that same shape, either going this way or that way, is because those corners are going to be, because the, the spine gives strength. But out here is where stuff gets messed up. And even your own Bible today, that's probably where there's damage. That's probably where, where it is. And this also has, from John 1.1, 1, 1, this is the beginning of the Gospel of John. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you've ever talked to Jehovah's Witnesses, here is that famous phrase at the end of John 1. John 1, kai theos ein halagos, and the word was God. Uh, hasn't been changed or anything. It's not the word was a God. And you notice the word God has a, is a nomina sacris. There's a line over the top of it. Only two letters, theta, sigma, is what you have there. It, God is theta, epsilon, omicron, sigma, but they, it has been abbreviated. So again, we see the nomina sacra taking place. Here's sort of one of my, my favorites. I was doing a doctorate on this, the subject of P45 down in South Africa, right up until my Dr. Vader in 2020 when COVID hit had a almost fatal heart attack and had to retire. And the only reason I was doing it was with him. He had done his PhD under Bruce Metzger. So uh, that project has been put on hold, unfortunately. This is P45, and this is from the Gospel of John in P45. P45 is unique because it's the only manuscript that originally contained Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Only one we found. Poor Acts always ends up off by itself someplace, all lonely and things like that, except in P45, uh, which uh, had Acts included in it. Uh, I could tell you much. I could tell you so much about that manuscript that you would all fall asleep very quickly. Um, here is P46, which I saw in Dublin. And I'll, I'll have to be fast on this, but I almost 
I almost got kicked out of the, out of the uh, Chester Beatty Library in Dublin because they had P46, they had it out, and it was, they had lights on it, but they have to be very careful what kind of light because it's, it's fading. Even with the care they're taking, you can tell it is still fading. But the light was up at the top, and it was very difficult to read. It was so dim. And so I realized the light's up at the top. As it reflects, it's going to reflect down here. And so I'm not going to do this right now, if you don't mind, because I'm tired. But normally, I get down on my knees. But I got down on my knees. I was younger back then. Uh, and I'm looking up at it. I'm going, oh, yeah. It's much easier to read here. And so I started reading, reading portions. It was in Philippians. Because P46 is the earliest manuscript we have of Paul's major epistle. And so I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden I hear behind me, sir, what are you doing? So can you imagine, can you imagine what happened? So the security guys are up there in the security booth, and they, they, they're watching their monitors. And all of a sudden, there's this guy down on his knees. And it's like, hey, Fred, yeah, Christians are worshiping the manuscripts again. Better go down there. <laughs> okay, I'm on my way, you know. And so I was trying to explain to him, actually, I'm, I'm reading the manuscript. And yeah, sure, all right, move along. Um, so uh, here is P46, and you'll see down here at the bottom, uh, that's pros philippasius to the Philippians. So I always have to do this. I do this with every group. And I'm really hoping because, look, we're in Louisiana. You folks are some of the nicest folks. I mean, you really are. Uh, Louisiana folks are so... So I'm hoping you're not going to do to me what Yankees do to me. And here's what happens. I'm going to ask you to, to vote on something in a moment. And I've just been doing this for years and years, and so I'm sort of keeping sort of a tally. But you know what happens? A lot of even my brothers and sisters in Christ, when I ask them to vote, just sit there. I'm not going to vote. You can't make me vote. There's probably a camera on me right now. This is going to end up on Facebook. I'm not going to vote. There are no cameras on you. I want everyone to participate. Okay? So here's the question. If this is the earliest manuscript we have of Paul's major epistles from around 200 AD, does it or does it not contain Hebrews? That's the big argument, isn't it? Who wrote Hebrews? So if this is the, the earliest manuscript we have, and it has Hebrews amongst Paul's other letters, that tells you someone in 200 already believed Paul wrote this, right? So that would be significant. So how many of you think P46 contains Hebrews? Put your hand up. You don't know? You Southwestern graduate don't know? That's not what you paid for? Okay, all right. <laughs> Oh, you don't know what you paid for. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So how many of you think it doesn't contain Hebrews? And how many of you just punked me? See? See? Did you, did you think there's a camera on you or something? But that's not the point. It could. <laughs> that's the microphone, actually. Okay. <laughs> It does contain Hebrews right after Romans. It contains Hebrews right after Romans. So I saw which way you voted. <laughs> now you know, don't you? Nah, you'll never forget that one. Yep, yep. Uh, but did your wife vote is the question. Did your wife vote? Okay, I'm not going to cause any marital problems this evening. So <laughs> we're just going to move on. <laughs> Uh, this is me real quickly. I was in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, Macquarie State University, looking at P91 many, many years ago. Uh, they asked me if I wanted to go sightseeing, and I said, yeah, I want to go see P91. <laughs> that's, that's what I think is exciting. My wife actually climbed the Sydney Bridge, and I'm doing P91, so that's just the weirdness uh, going on there. All right, back to the facts. So after the peace of the church in AD 313, remember, the uh, most intense period of persecution in the history of the church was 303 to 313. 303 to 313. Keep that in mind. So after the Peace Church 313, Christians could have professional scribes copy the scriptures. At this time, the great vellum or leather manuscripts begin to appear, including the three greatest of these, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Alexandrinus. Sinaiticus and Vaticanus may well have been amongst the Bibles copied with imperial monies at the time of the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. So here is... Um, 
That's pretty much what Sinaiticus looked like when I saw it in London in 2005. Um, and what was amazing is I walk in, I'm the only person in the room. And I'm staying there, and under glass is Codex Sinaiticus. Right next to it is Codex Alexandrinus. Behind me is a Tyndale Bible, a 1611 King James, and I think a Wycliffe Bible. And I'm the only one in the room. I mean, I'm like, one, one uh, Muslim terrorist, and it's all gone. I mean, boom, you know? And there's just, I, I was like, well, am I not supposed to be in here? This was, it was really weird. But that's what it looks like. But that doesn't tell you a whole lot until you see what it actually looks like. Oh, stop that. Remember, folks, that's handwritten. That is handwritten. And the important thing to keep in mind is, this was, when, when this was discovered, uh, it was the oldest manuscript around at the time. It's not anymore. But it was the oldest complete Bible for quite some time because it contains the Old Testament in Greek as well. So it goes from Genesis to Revelation. Um, it was found by Count von Tischendorf in St. Catherine's Monastery. There is an entire, oh, there are people that say it's a fake and a fraud and all this stuff, and there's movies about it and all this weird, weird stuff. I even did a debate on it uh, a few years ago on, online. Um, but what is sort of fun to me to, to realize is Count von Tischendorf, for example, to even get into St. Catherine's Monastery, you have to be pulled up in a basket up over the wall to get in uh, there in the Sinai Desert. And he had visited a number of times. I could give you the whole story. We don't have time for it tonight. Um, but the, the one thing that I find really interesting is that there's a lot of people who believe, and there's good evidence, that Count von Tischendorf was the uh, model of a very well-known movie character from our time period. In fact, just put out a movie that I don't think anybody watched. Um, but a lot of people believe Count von Tischendorf was the model for Indiana Jones because he traveled the ancient world he was a believing Christian, a conservative believing Christian, which in Germany was pretty unusual. But he just, he was convinced there had to be earlier manuscripts out there that would help to verify uh, the antiquity and accuracy of the Bible. And he was right uh, when he discovered uh, Sinaiticus. Now, how that got into Russia and then to England and everything else is a rather sordid tale. Uh, you can go to Sin codexsinaiticus.org and you can zoom in on, on things. You can see here, for example, a, a textual variant here uh, in the text, which obviously is written much, much later. You can see the, the ink's very different. Um, but you can have light coming straight down, like up here, or from the sides, so you can see the very surface of the, of the parchment. It's really neat what you can do. I hope they update it pretty soon, because it's getting rather old uh, in its technology. Uh, but it's still there at codexsinaiticus.org uh, to check that out. You can also today uh, have all of Codex Vaticanus is now online as well, uh, only for the past few years. Uh, and remember, Codex Vaticanus is the one that's related to P75. Um, and Codex Vaticanus, you want to, I, I, I know it's getting late, but um, you want a real quick inside story from the publishing world? How many of you know the book uh, Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin? Okay. I was given the opportunity of being a part of an editing of that book. Um, and I edited the chapters on Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. They have since undone all the edits and put it back. I'm not sure why we did that. But anyway, um, in the chapter on Jehovah's Witnesses, Dr. Martin had said that Codex Vaticanus uh, testified to the deity of Christ in the book of Revelation by calling Jesus the Alpha and Omega. That's only one problem. Codex Vaticanus ends at Hebrews 9.14. And what is called Codex Vaticanus after that is a 10th century minuscule manuscript. And so I had fixed that, and then the family insisted that everything be taken, put back the way it was. So if you buy it today, it'll still say that, even though it's an error. And we've known it's been an error for a long time, but oh well, that's how things work. So there's Codex uh, Vaticanus, there's Codex Alexandrinus. I need to speed up here. Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay, we've got lots of other manuscript translations. We have more than 124 Greek manuscript witnesses within the first 300 years after the writing of the New Testament, far more than any other work of antiquity. In fact, 
clicky, clicky, clicky. There we go. There we go. In fact, <laughs> now that is a little bit mean, okay? All right. <laughs> I, didn't ex I would expect that in New York, not Louisiana. <laughs> Got some Yankees in the group here. Um, in fact, we have 12 manuscripts from the second century. That is, within 100 years of the writing of the New Testament, these manuscripts contain portions of all four Gospels, nine books of Paul, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation, comprising the majority of the books the New Testament possess today. Again, no work of antiquity even comes close to this early attestation. You'll never hear that from the critics. They'll quote all the other books and then put down the New Testament that has much earlier attestation than the other books they quote from. There's massive inconsistency all the way across the board. The average length of time, and this is what I mentioned earlier, between the writing of most works contemporaneous to the New Testament, such as the historical works of Pliny, Suetonius, or Tacitus, and their first extant copies between 500 and 9 hundred years. We're going to have a, an, an audio, if you're ready for audio back here. I asked Bart Ehrman during cross-examination this question. I never expected the answer that I got. This is the leading English-speaking critic of the New Testament in the world today, okay? Listen to what he said from our cross-examination. Um, on the Unbelievable Radio Program in London, you discussed the length of time that exists between the writing of Paul's letter to the Galatians and the first extant copy, that being 150 years. Uh, you describe this time period as enormous. That's a quote. Could you tell us what term you would use to describe the time period between, say, the original writings of Suetonius or Tacitus or Pliny and their first extant manuscript copies? Very enormous. Sort of ginormous would be a good one? Ginormous. Ginormous, okay. Yeah. Uh, Gi I mean, ginormous doesn't cover it. Uh, <laughs> the New Testament, we have much earlier uh, attestation than for any other book from antiquity. Did you hear that? For the New Testament, we have much earlier attestation than for any other book of antiquity. And he's the guy they're all reading. I almost fainted when he said that. And in fact, I almost interrupted him before he said it. I'm so thankful I didn't, because that was an amazing admission from Bart Ehrman. Now, really quickly, um, the phone game. Remember the phone game where you'd, you know, you'd whisper something to somebody else's ear and it goes around the circle, and by the time it comes back, it's in Swahili, you know, something like that. Um, that's how people think the New Testament came to exist, is that, is that you got one manuscript that's copied by someone, the next one, and the next one. In fact, I've gone to Mormon ward chapels where that's how they presented how, how the New Testament was passed along, was sort of, sort of like the phone game. But that's not how the New Testament came to us at all. Um, and I want you, and this is, if, if you need to even stand up and stretch your back or something, go ahead and do it, because this is the most important part of tonight, all right? This is what you, this is what you need to know. I don't care if you move around or, or anything else, but I want, you to, I want you to catch this. And I want you to see my map. Um, because, yeah, see, Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, multiple lines, multiple points of origin, multiple audiences. You need to understand that you have multiple authors, they're writing to multiple different cities and audiences at multiple different times. There was never any one time when any one group, you know, you see all this stuff on uh, on YouTube today where you've got hooded monks and they're running around, they're copying manuscripts and, and they're, they're determining which books are going to be in the Bible. It's a bunch of baloney. It never happened. Never happened. Instead, you have multiple authors writing from multiple locations. Even Paul, he doesn't write all of his letters from one place, does he? He's writing from a lot of different places. He's writing from in prison. He's writing before prison, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe even after prison for all we know. And they're writing to different places. And so John's doing the same thing. And Luke, we're not sure exactly where he is and how long it takes him to write. There's all sorts of different authors that are writing to different audiences at different times. And so there's no one group that could ever control those manuscripts. All right? So then once they start getting copied, 
and they start, they start forming into bodies. So like P46. So by 200, there's a manuscript of someone who's collecting purposefully Paul's major works. I can understand why his minor works, like 1st, 2nd Timothy, it's going to take longer for something like that to become known because those, those were private letters. Romans was read in the church at Rome, so there's going to be people who want copies of that. So that's going to be much better known at a, at a faster rate of speed. It makes, it makes sense when you think about it. But what you end up happening, happening then is you have all these things going all over the known world, and they're all being copied by different people at different times, becoming collected here, collected there, and that means there was never a time. Do you remember, uh, any of you old enough to remember Shirley MacLaine? Remember the, the actress Shirley MacLaine? Um, sometime in the 1980s, I remember, she got into the New Age. And she did this movie, Out on a Limb. And uh, I remember in the movie, she's walking along the seashore, uh, and her guru is, is teaching her to say, I am God, I am God, I am God. And all of us are sitting home going, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. And, and she'd, she'd go around and she'd tell people that the Bible used to contain reincarnation, but they took it out at the Council of Constantinople. Can anyone in here tell me what year the Council of Constantinople took place? Off the top of your head, no Googling. Yeah, see, 381, by the way, but I teach church history, so what? Nothing at the Council of Constantinople had anything to do with this. And could that have even happened? Could a council in 381 have taken a doctrine out of the text of Scripture? No. It, is, it was already spread all over the known world. If they gathered up the stuff they had in Constantinople and tried to make a change, then that would be glaringly obvious when compared to the manuscripts from someplace else. So all this stuff you get from gurus and stuff like that, the Mormons or the Muslims or ever, saying, well, stuff's been taken out and stuff's been put in and, and, and things like that. It's impossible because of the way that God preserved his word. He had it go all across the known world quickly and rapidly. Some of those manuscripts we've looked, like, look, we've looked at were already buried in the sands of Egypt by the time Constantine came along, he couldn't find them or change them. And so when, when people say, well, how is it preserved? It was preserved in the entire manuscript tradition, not just one place, not just one manuscript, but in the fact that it was distributed everywhere, keeps it from being edited and changed. And that's the biggest accusation, is that, well, you know, the deity of Christ has been inserted. That's what my Muslim friends say. And I go, When? When was it inserted? Because I can show you manuscripts all over the place that teach the deity of Christ that go all the way back to the beginning. So when did this allegedly happen? Show me the manuscripts where that isn't taught in the New Testament. And they can't. They can't do it. Because of the way God's preserved the word. It, and, and that's not how people today think. We're used to printing presses and books and and thumb indexing and all the rest of that kind of stuff, and now uh, computer versions and stuff like that, that's not how antiquity worked. That's not how things happened back then. Instead, you have this mechanism where God preserves his word by spreading it all over uh, the world, and hence no one is able to get uh, control of things and, and uh, edit things and, and do things like that. So, let me try to, I guess I had one more. Oh, oh well, I, I guess I had a lot of, that's just, that took me a long time to do that. So uh, I guess we can watch the books moving around. Uh, there we go. All right. So it's vitally important to realize the transmission of the text in the New Testament did not follow a phone game single line. Not only are written documents less liable to corruption than what is whispered in the ear, but the phone game involves a single line of transmission. The New Testament originated in multiple places, written by multiple authors with books being sent to multiple locations. And what that means, therefore, is this multifocality leads us to the final considerations that demonstrate the bankruptcy of the modern tax on the New Testament, and we'll, we'll try to wrap up here as quickly as we, as we can. To make specific changes in a text like the New Testament, which originally circulated as a group of texts, not as a single body, would require a centralized controlling body that can make wholesale changes in these widely dispersed Text. But the fact of the matter is, 
No such agency ever existed or could have existed. Christianity was a persecuted religion made up mainly of the lower classes. There was no central authority that could ever have gathered up all the texts, made the wholesale changes. Such was impossible in the earliest days of transmission. And given that we have such ancient texts now, obviously could not have happened at a later point without giving clear evidence when we compare these manuscripts with one another. And so all those accusations simply collapse upon the consideration of these particular uh, realities. So let me, um, we looked at the papyri already. I did want to look at a couple of texts real quick uh, before we wrap up because I think it's important. And you can get all these slides, by the way, online at, at YouTube if you want to track down where I've done this before. If you want to, uh, I, I see some people taking pictures of stuff, and that's fine, I don't care. Um, oh, okay, but this leads to another important point. When scribes copied their texts, they were very conservative, often incorporating marginal notes into the text since they could not be sure if the note was original or not. Think about it, when you're making a handwritten manuscript and you're, it's made of parchment, very expensive. Most people assume that in our money today, if you had wanted a copy of something like Codex Sinaiticus, it would have cost you over $8,000. And who, who had that kind of money? And so you, if you're copying a page in parchment, you can't just rip it up and throw it out. You, what you do is if you miss something, you write it in the margin. Well, if someone's copying your manuscript and you're dead and they can't ask you, what are they going to do? They're going to include what you put in the margin in their copy, assuming that you, were, you, were, you meant it to be there. But what if that was just a note you put there to explain something? Like in John 5, 4. That's how John, that John 5, 4 was a marginal note. Think about it, what is it talking about? It's explaining why they're all sitting around this pool because of the story of the angel coming down and troubling the water. And so that's clearly a, because it's not in the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of John, where did it come from? It's a marginal note. It's explaining to people stuff that people in Jerusalem knew, but people outside of Jerusalem wouldn't know. It was a marginal note. It became incorporated into the text at a later point in time. That's where John 5, 4 comes from. Uh, the tenacity of the text, very, very important, uh, but I do want to get to a couple of these things. Um, okay, key theological example. 1 Timothy 3.16. Look at 1 Timothy 3.16. I'll use this as the last one. Uh, while you're looking it up, let me just mention something. I always make sure that everyone knows this. I want everyone in this room when they leave to be aware of the fact we have two major variants in the New Testament, both of which are 12 verses long each. What are they? Mark 16, 9 through 20. John 7, 53 through 8, 11. So the longer ending of Mark, there are at least four endings of Mark. And if the longer ending was original, you wouldn't need the other ones. Um, and then what's called the pericope adultery, the story of the woman taken in adultery, John 7, 53 through 8, 11, which, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, does not occur until the 5th century in any manuscript it first appears in the most unreliable manuscript we have from the early church called Codex Beze Canterburgiensis. It's sort of like the living Bible of the early church. And that's the first place it appears. And in our manuscripts, it appears in three different places in John and two different places in Luke. So it is a story that was looking for a place to land, and it eventually landed in John 7, 53 through 8, 11. But again, only in the 5th century. Uh, it took quite some time for that to happen. You need to be aware of those two. That's the only two there are. I have seen unbelieving people use those two examples, and since people weren't aware of it, and they didn't know that we were aware of it, then it had much more impact upon them than it should have upon them. Uh, but that, that's, I just want to make sure everyone knows those are the two longest. Other than that, you're talking about single lines, single verse, something along those lines. Or you have 1 Timothy 3.16. And 1 Timothy 3.16, King James and the New American Standard, let's compare them together. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. King James says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, received up into glory. The New American Standard says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, 
proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, taken up in glory. Now look, I've heard the preaching, okay? And I can guarantee you someplace south of the Mason-Dixon line this coming Sunday, there's going to be somebody in a Baptist church that's going to quote this verse and say, see, if you've got the King James Bible, you've got the truth that God was manifest in the flesh. And these unbelieving liberals, they don't believe us. They change it to he who. I've heard it. You can go online. You can watch the, the interview that uh, Stephen Anderson did with me, and that ended up being, being in, a, in a movie that was all about 1 Timothy 3.16. So it happens pretty much every single weekend. All right? He who and God don't look like they're pretty much close to each other, are they? No, they don't. But let's take a look at the actual evidence. So here is the variant right here. Has ephanerothe en sarki. So he who was manifest in the flesh. You've got that little thing right there. You look over here and you see... Uh, that's Codex Beze Canterburgiensis, by the way, so we can ignore that one. Uh, here's Theos, God. That's the corrector of Sinaiticus, the corrector of A, the corrector of C, the correct, uh, second letter hand of D, and some others. It's a majority reading. The original hand of Sinaiticus is he who, the original hand of, of Alexandrinus, et cetera, et cetera. But what's helpful is to actually see what it would have looked like in the original language. So... Here is what you would have as the difference between the two. Clear enough for you? I'll use color again. There is the difference in the, in the manuscripts, but here let me blow it up so it's nice and big for you. There is a difference between God and he who. God is a nomina sacra, two letters, theta sigma with a line over top. Omicron, Sigma, Haas. And what were the original, what were the early uh, manuscripts written on? Papyrus. So what have you seen in papyrus? Lines. Veins of the, of the leaves. Pretty easy to confuse these two words. This isn't something where we're, we're going to change the doctrine and da 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 we're, gonna, we're a bunch of liberals. And No. It's another textual variant that's fully understandable as to what the difference is. And by the way, I could point out to you that my Legacy Standard Bible, my NA28, calls Jesus God at John 1.18. The King James doesn't. Does that mean the King James translators are trying to hide the deity of Christ? Of course not. It has nothing to do with it. And yet that's what's preached constantly, like a drumbeat, when there is a much more obvious answer as to why the variant uh, exists. Uh, yeah, there's John 1.18 right there. Uh, And let me show you one other thing real quick, and then we'll be done. Um, oh, by the way, there's, there's the data for the Pericope adulterae. And just for those of you that are interested, uh, so it appears after 753, uh, in some manuscripts after 8.3, uh, in others after John 21.25, and then in other manuscripts after Luke 21.38, and other manuscripts after Luke 24, 53. It's the only variant that does that, the only one. There is nothing else like that in the history of the New Testament. It's a story looking for a place to land, and it eventually landed at uh, John 7, 53. One last thing, John, Kama Yohanium. Kama Yohanium. I, I met a guy named Alberto Rivera. Uh, remember Jack Chick? How many, remember, how many remember Jack Chick? You know the cartoon tracks? You know, This Was Your Life, Holy Joe. Wow, am I that old? Really? Come on, people. In fourth grade, I was sent to the principal's office for passing out Jack Chick tracks on the playground. The only time I'd ever been sent to the principal's office, I was a good little boy. And I didn't really know what to do. And so I walked in and I handed him one too. And... Uh, so he just told me I couldn't force anyone to take a track, which I found really ironic because I was one of the littler guys. I couldn't force anybody to take anything anyway. And so Jack Chick put out those comic books, the Alberto comic books about Roman Catholicism and stuff like that. And he's a King James only guy. What's amazing is I went from fourth grade 
passing out Jack Trick, Trick, Trick tracks to when I wrote the King James Only Controversy, Jack Trick, Trick eventually identified me as the Antichrist. <laughs> That's quite a move uh, over time. Um, but uh, Alberto Rivera, I met him once. He was Jack Chick's former Roman Catholic priest guy, little short guy. And uh, I met him, and the weird thing was, he was speaking at a non-Trinitarian church. It was a oneness church. And I'm like, that's weird. But uh, anyway, first thing he said when, when I, I approached him, what Bible are you carrying? I had a New American Standard. You're going to hell. <laughs> Bing, bang, boom. Why am I going to hell? Because your Bible doesn't have 1 John 5, 7. This verse. 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three are one. Look at the NASB. It simply says, for there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. These three are in agreement. So there you have in red what the comma Johannium is. And that's um, obviously a theologically relevant text. But as I say here, there is no text more directly relevant to the integrity of the New Testament text. For if such a vitally important theological text can disappear en toto from the Greek manuscript tradition, then we have absolutely no confidence whatsoever that we still possess the original readings of these ancient writings. No Greek text of the first 1,300 years of its history contains the text found in the Textus Receptus, which is the basis of the King James Version of the Bible. Um, the text first appears in certain Latin texts in the 4th century, most probably as a gloss or an explanation of the spirit, water, and blood. While it is found in a few 10th and 11th century Greek manuscripts, it is only written in the margins in a 16th or 17th century hand. The following manuscripts are the only ones that contain the verse in the actual Greek text of a Greek manuscript. Uh, so you have 14th, 15th century, 1520, 16th, 16th, even an 18th century. Uh, which is sort of irrelevant since long after the invention of printing. But here, notice this one, 1520. How do we know that? Well, we know that because that's Codex Monfortianus, number 61. And that one, Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland, was presented to Erasmus. We'll talk about Erasmus a lot tomorrow night. It was presented to Erasmus as evidence of the reading appeared in a Greek text. Erasmus even asked his friend, Bombastius in Rome to consult Vaticanus, Bombastius confirmed that B does not contain the comma Johannium. And here's a picture. This is what Codex Monfortianus reads. This is a picture of, that's my friend uh, Doug. You can see my arm right there. We are in the reading room in Dublin, in Trinity College, reading Codex Monfortianus. I checked it out for myself. Uh, and and gave the, I, I gave the transcription on my phone at that particular point in time. It's now available online. About six months later, they made it completely available online. But it's still fun to see it. <laughs> in fact, if you've ever seen Trinity College in Dublin, it's one of the most amazing things you will ever see. It, Google it. Sometime. Google Reading Room Trinity College and go, you've got to be kidding me. It was pretty impressive. Here's the point. There's what it looks like. There's Codex Monfortianus. Here's the point. If you make that the standard, then there were no Christians before the 13th century. If you make that the standard, it disappeared from all Greek manuscripts and had to be restored from the Latin. If you do that, you have destroyed the integrity of the New Testament text. And nobody who promotes that position does that with any other text whatsoever. The inconsistency is astonishing. And we must be consistent you can't have one, have one argument for this text and do a different argument for this text and a different argument for this text, and that's the only way you can defend, as we will see tomorrow night, King James Onlyism. You have to be consistent in how you do all these things. So I think I have a concluding slide in here, and we'll try to get over to that one. In summary, hey, look at that. 400,000 variants, 99% inconsequential. Most thoroughly documented work of antiquity. Spread all over the world quickly, no controlling authority. Any later editing would stand out clearly in comparison with ancient manuscripts. God has preserved his word for us, not by giving us a single manuscript in a monastery someplace, 
but by distributing those copies all around the world so they could not be controlled and could not be changed. That's how he's done it. He has given us the most manuscripts, the earliest attestation, widest attestation. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever. When I debated Gregory Coles less than two weeks ago, and we argued about what arsenokoitai means at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we didn't have to go, we don't have any idea what Paul wrote at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The fact is, we know, it, we know exactly what he wrote. And we know it exactly because we have multiple manuscripts from multiple times. We have multiple translations in other languages that reflect the exact same thing. And it could not have been changed over time. And that's the foundation that we have for being able to, to, to believe that when you get up to preach from Romans 5.1 and say, there, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We know Paul said, we have peace with God. Now, are there textual variants even in Romans 5.1? Yeah, there is. Do they change the meaning? That's the point. We have access to that information. If we only had one manuscript, we wouldn't know that. We wouldn't have that. We'd be in the same boat that the, that the Muslims are in with the Quran. And I'm glad we're not in that boat. I'm really glad we're not in that boat. All right, I've had you sitting for two hours, and some of you had just visited Starbucks on your way in. You're about to die. I'm sorry about that. So tomorrow evening, having laid those foundations, looked at those manuscripts, tomorrow evening, uh, in a shorter period of time, uh, the goal will be to ask the question, well, what about translations? Is there supposed to be one English translation, uh, something like that? Now, you're, you have a microphone in your hand. Is that because you're going to say something or because you're going to want questions? Oh, when I'm done. Okay. Um, and we're just simply going to address the King James only issue. It's something I've been dealing with most of my adult life. Uh, the King James only controversy has had a huge impact in that area. I've done a number of debates on the subject. Um, though a lot of the leading people. How many of you have ever seen the Ankerberg show, the, uh, the five-part Ankerberg series? A few of you have. It's, uh, is it on YouTube? It was on YouTube for a while. Um, and some of you go, that wasn't you. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm the young guy with the, without the beard and with hair. Yeah, I did. It just all fell down. You know, when you get old, it gets tired. It can't get to the top. It comes out your beard. Um, but uh, we've, we've done a lot of work on this subject. And so uh, we will address that subject tomorrow evening and maybe have time for some questions, too, uh, afterwards, uh, try, to, try to do that. So, brother, take it away. Well, thank you, Dr. White. We greatly appreciate you.